Hey, hey, welcome to Left Field Tarot. Oh, upside down. Okay. So, our house placement is the eighth house, which is the house of inner value. And the question that this house asks of us is what are the possessions of my relationships? It's about transformation as a shadow, taxes, insurance, death, inheritance regeneration, sex, longevity, and vulnerability. It's also about renewal and deeply felt peak experiences, growth, change, and deep interaction with others. So the eighth house is all the juicy stuff. <laughs> your deep interactions with others, the transformation of your own shadow, sex, death, and taxes. Placements. We have Taurus rising, Aries rising, and Moon and Sagittarius. Taurus rising represents the physical body, the outward style, social personality, how you dawn on people. Fierce, dependable, strong willed, loves the good life, hard working, very sensual. Loves being active, creative with the hands. Likes crafts and gardening. It's ruled by Venus. So this means refined taste and appreciation of beauty, love, and abundance. These are all the realm of Venus. Taurus is ruled by Venus and also so is Libra. Aries rising is ruled by Mars. And this represents the physical body, outward style. Again, rising sign. So it is how you dawn on people. So you've got sort of two different things here going, which almost to me seems like you might be a Gemini rising because <laughs> there's two different sides to this. But to continue on with Aries, brave, opinionated, independent, powerful and commanding presence can be seen as intimidating. Aries is the fierce warrior of the Zodiac, the one that leads the cavalry. Intensely competitive, trailblazer, leaps before looking, asks for forgiveness, not permission, acts on instincts, which are usually spot on, because Aries is also a very mental sign, very ruled by the brain. A lot of uh, sapiosexuals are Aries or Aries rising, or dare I say, Venus and Aries, which is what I am, actually. Moon in Sagittarius. The need for personal freedom and space. Happy and easygoing, this is a placement of open spaces and a need for activity. The placement of a helpful spirit. The moon in Sagittarius can forget details and appointments, but remains optimistic. Very outdoorsy, loves change of scenery and enjoys friendly competition, which makes sense because Sagittarius is the archer. Escapist, the runner, loves to wing it, free-spirited, adaptable, and hungry for knowledge. So we've got a bit of earth here, and then we've got a lot of fire. And a very strong way to dawn on people commanding, opinionated, independent, fierce, fierce on both of these rising signs here, dependable, strong-willed, hard-working, sensual, helpful and free-spirited, optimistic, a really well-rounded, enthusiastic, positive picture this paints here. You got some really beautiful qualities. I'm wondering how this intersects with sex, death, and taxes. I would say that the sex part makes sense with Moon Sagittarius and Aries rising. Well, and Taurus rising too, because of the sensuality and the fierceness and the the power. And Sagittarius tends to 
shoot from the thighs, so to speak. Um, very sexual sign. Very free-spirited and adaptable. Hungry for knowledge, but also hungry for experience. I'm not really sure what else to say about that. I can see where it works in with sex. I can see a little bit with maybe uh, insurance and taxes and longevity with Taurus being earthy and um, security minded. But let me continue on here and see what else we come up with. Yeah, for the Sabian symbols, 22 Pisces, a prophet bringing down the new law from Mount Sinai. Man's success in meeting the challenge of a new order. Codification of new values. Holding oneself to highest standards. Revelations. Channeling information. Truths revealed. The Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. Laying down the law. The Ark of the Covenant. 28 degrees Libra. A man in deep gloom, unnoticed. Angels come to his help. Spiritual sustainment given to him who opens himself to the full destiny, his full destiny. Slow realization of betterment. Unsolicited help. Realizing you are not alone. Awareness of spiritual help. Angels. Changes in the weather. Salvation versus depression. Counselors. People who lend a hand. Then we have 22 Virgo. A royal coat of arms enriched with precious stones. Preservation of ancient values. It says race values, but they mean human race. And I wish now that I wouldn't have written that down because it it sounds like it's it's trying to divide people and it's actually referring to everyone as a whole. Like the ancient values of the human race. But anyway, preservation of ancient values. For healthy veneration by youthful individuals. Certification of merit aristocracy, long lineage, standing behind nobility, hereditary issues, having rights and prestige, inheritances. Okay, so there we have a, an appearance by inheritances from the 8th house. Four degrees Sag, a little child learning to walk. Life's kindliness and creating safe opportunities for growth. Full appreciation of opportunity found in crisis and self-development also found in crisis genuine progress instinctive determination feeling mother earth's support and taking delight in the smallest progress relying on skills not yet mastered three degree sag two men playing chess recreation of a world of manifestation through symbols and intelligence Schooled confidence in the judgment of self. Strategic competition. Seeing the picture several moves ahead. Trying to knock out the opponent. Arguments, court battles, war strategies. Law, divorce, matching wits. And then we have 29 degrees Taurus. Two cobblers working at a table. A symbol of discursive reason, the battle of pros and cons within the inner being, analytical recapitulative judgment, partnerships and sharing, repairs to the soul, workbenches, the marriage of minds, demarcations of work. So this is interesting. I get the feeling like there's been some difficulty around tradition, partnership, and competition. But that through this difficulty, and possibly actually the law in some way or another, or possibly like documents or, or legal agreements, but through this difficulty, there's um, an expansion of spirituality, of connection with 
something bigger than oneself and bigger than maybe the previous world view or the maybe the parameters have kind of opened up as far as the information you're able to grab from various places to synthesize and put into a whole when you're assessing something if that makes sense like like instead of having um, maybe like a, a magazine like a copy of Esquire or something that like you can refer to an article for like one or two facts you've got access to Google um, that sort of like opening up of information channels like you're not saying that you're completely expanded to a Google degree that would be a bit overwhelming but that you're starting to be able to like open up little portals here and there and draw in fresh new information that is helping you transform some of the, the areas in life that were not getting a lot of light that were perhaps heavier and possibly preventing you from really finding balance and feeling like you had safe opportunities for growth. It feels like right now you're sort of getting your bearings, maybe just sort of processing a lot of this new information. With the rising signs that we came up with here and the moon in Sagittarius, there's it's, you know the spire and and earth the Venus influence and we have you know the influence of the moon with, with Sag here it's like I get the feeling of it like somebody who's naturally like if they were left to their own devices and nobody put any sort of like parameters or barriers or or expectations on them would ordinarily be a very happy go lucky person you know, somebody that is just kind of likes to joke around, has a smile on their face for everybody. And then with the eighth house, with all these like serious topics and vulnerability and growth and change, your deep interactions with others, if you've had problems in the areas of, of partnership, or of tradition or feeling like you had safe non-judgmental areas and opportunities for growth feeling like if you, you know if you didn't have that sense of like competition these these sorts of issues like weigh down this this naturally sort of bright and and light filled personality so part of the shadow might be possibly like a mistaken perception of what your place is in these situations of competition of partnership of tradition that perhaps because of the difficulties you've had, they might have colored your perception of your your true self. And, and what I mean by that is they may have led you to believe that you're more on the negative side than the positive side. It may have sort of pulled like a, a veil over this optimism and this sort of natural like like friendly puppy dogness you know like openness and and natural instinct to trust and to be loving 
you know, um, there might have been like some, especially when indicating the, you know, the need for spiritual sustainment. Slow realization is betterment. Realizing you're not alone. When you realize you're not alone, that's preceded by feeling alone. Because you can't realize you're not alone if you know you're not alone already. You know what I mean? You have to think that you're alone in order to be primed to have a transition into, hey, I'm not alone. So, I think that part of that loneliness stems directly from any difficulties cutting you off from this natural amiability. But I also see that you're coming out of it and that you're trusting your inner voice more and you're holding yourself to different and higher standards. And I think that you've gotten a lot of insight and almost I'd say like a just a bright light has shone on a lot of things that were in the dark. And so I think you're processing that. And maybe getting used to the feel of removing yourself from that mental place of competition. Because, I mean, competition can be a, a, a good thing in sports, you know. And, and it can be a good thing to, if it's friendly competition. But I, I don't know that I have really witnessed that much friendly competition in my own experience and I am older than uh, the dinosaurs so I think that um, most of the time competition is like that that quote uh, comparison is the thief of joy it's really hard to because competition it makes you step outside of yourself and then you're you're victimizing yourself with the observer effect um, becoming too self-conscious and about all of the wrong things. Because really the only thing that we need to do is be the best us that we can be, you know. The best you you can be. It doesn't matter what anybody else is in that regard. Because what you bring to the table is beautiful and unique and when left to its own devices, a breath of fresh air for people. So, one of your art oracle cards is Titian. Go viral, not bacterial. A flattered client is a repeat client. Your personality can be as colorful as your canvas. So, I guess a go viral, not bacterial is because Titian died of the plague, which is unfortunate. Um, he did uh, a lot of tastefully sexy mythological scenes, which he compared to poetry. Sort of embraced that passion and romance, finding the, the poetic in the mythological and the sexy in the poetic. J.M.W. Turner. He did a lot of, I guess they would call them proto-impressionistic paintings, where he animated the landscapes and basically found divinity in the details. So his card says, find the facts in a feeling. Nature does not sit still. The sun will rise whether or not you're there to watch it. 
So the sun will rise whether or not you're there. Watch it. Time marches on, I suppose. And some things do happen whether we witness them or we don't. They don't depend upon us to, to continue moving. Big wheel keep on turning, I guess. But nature does not sit still, so. And nature abhors a vacuum. So do cats. Find the facts in a feeling. That, to me, it speaks of, like, authenticity. Of, you, I mean, you can really find the truth in feeling. Genuine feeling, not feeling that is trying to cover up, like, wounding or something, but like feeling your way through things. And going through a, a transformation and, and, and going through difficulties there's there's probably like a recalibration or some sort of an adjustment that you're you're maybe subconsciously going through where you're kind of um, learning how to be in your body again learning how to be in your feelings in your in your heart and it's it's not really an easy experience when a whole bunch of new information comes in and you have conflicts going on. I think, too, it's speaking about like the, the opening up of your intuition and, and listening to your inner guidance. Freedom is your Ascended Master card. And it certainly seems like you are freeing yourself from certain restrictions on your on your personality, on your very nature, which is the next card is nature. Ground yourself. Find a sanctuary in nature. Connect with the elementals. Just sitting outside and watching the birds for like 10 or 15 minutes can be amazingly therapeutic. And I think it's also about connecting to your true deep nature. And beautiful unicorn there. Which, yeah, they're on every card in the deck. But still, there's a reason why there's unicorn cards in this reading. Because unicorns are pretty special. And so are you. Intention. Be clear and decisive. Focus on what you really want. Be bold with your requests to the universe. Yeah, definitely. The universe does not mind. <laughs> Enthusiasm is bonus points. Look at those enormous wings. Wow. I feel like this is saying, I'm just getting this, this intuitive hit off of this card that, pardon me, particularly with fire being indicated here with the, with the signs. That you have great personal power and believing in your intention and the power of your intention as far as being able to manifest things that you want. Manifest endeavors, people, places, experiences. You've got a great amount of personal power. So, focus on what you really want, and don't quantify it, whatever it is, it's not too big a request, because you never know unless you ask, right? And it looks to me like you've got an excellent chance of getting what you're asking for here. Oh yeah, Crystal Keys, number 22. I'm seeing like the opening up of the crown chakra here and I don't know, this is either like, you know, guidance or like Lawrence Welk is in the building, but uh, nobody's going to probably get that. Again, olders and dinosaurs, but this card to me says uh, template, like, like you have the crystal keys to 
the mansion, so to speak. Um, that what you're going through here, the experiences that you're having, you're setting a, a precedent for going through this particular, very specific combination of circumstances. Once we sent, set a precedent, it's a, it's a rule of physics that that means that whatever event set that precedent, has a greater likelihood of being repeated. And what my guidance has told me is that these precedents, you can sort of picture them as being uploaded to the unified field, to the collective unconscious, to that field of energy that we are all ultimately connected to. And when that precedent is in the unified field, then it is available to those who seek it. So when you go through conflicts, when you go through difficulties, it isn't just about your experience. When you go through these things successfully, meaning you go through them and you come out in one piece and you can, you can get lessons that will like I heard uh, Brian Callen the comedian say on a podcast that life is basically a series of adjustments to minimize pain so when you can go through something successfully and you can successfully make those adjustments to minimize pain and learn from them and learn why they were needed why what was in place before caused pain, then you're helping everyone. So even if, even if you're somebody like me who's completely cut off from, from civilization practically and, and other people, any sort of like, you know, normal sort of relationship with another human being, Still, what you do matters greatly. What you do always matters. So, never let anybody tell you that it doesn't. Entanglement. So this could refer to difficult, complicated relationships. This can also refer to quantum entanglement. Particles that interact or that connect in a certain state always remain entangled. They always have an effect on one another. Their vibrations are always communicating even if they are great distances apart through space and time. So the concept of entanglement is what Albert Einstein called spooky action at a distance, which I love that. So you could speak about the um, any conflicts that you've had in partnerships or relationships of any kind. It could also speak to feeling connected to someone that's not near you physically. And it's interesting, I'm just considering like the, how it relates to the eighth house, inner values. Well, I mean, if you're entangled with somebody in that way, then it would certainly strike your inner core. So I can see, yeah. Specialness, number 52. So there's like seven stars on here. I think... I really feel like this is waving a sign at you and saying, hey, remember earlier we were talking about how special you are and how great your personality is? Hey, well, have some gold stars for that. <laughs> Fire, ha, with Sagittarius and Aries in our, in our placement cards. I, I just, 
I, I heard like that that song. I don't want to set the world on fire, but at the same time, I heard I want to set the world on fire. And that makes me think of like the 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 juxtaposition of tradition with really moving into authenticity and passion. So I think that there's enthusiasm here. And maybe it's enthusiasm you haven't felt in a while. Let me let me go over actually this way and save the quotes for last. Okay, so these we have Murph. Balance is coming in your personal symbols. So balance is coming. That's that's good news. You've had conflicts, you've had difficulties, it's been a bit of a rocky road. But there's an energetic shift and things are going to start to level out. Your personal symbols, this is referring to working with your guides, working with your sort of your own um, personal guidebook of symbolism. I'm trying to think of like one of my personal symbols. Um, Oh, okay, well, here's one. It's completely ridiculous, and it's not a great one, but um, it's random enough it might be entertaining. A lot of a lot of my symbols are catchphrases, because what 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 I'm talking about is is my guides will show me one of my symbols, or they'll play a sound bite or something, and it's kind of like the um, bottle caps on Mickey's wide mouth beer, where it's like there's an a picture of an I and then a plus sign and then the letter U or you know I mean it's just sort of like this puzzle that you put things together right these like random symbols and and sounds and in jokes and things and so when something is like inexplicable or non sequitur my symbol for that is that's why they call it Roost Country Kitchen because there's a story of friends of mine that went to this restaurant called Roost Country Kitchen and the waitress came up and my friend was like, oh, this food is so good. And the waitress said, that's why they call it Roost Country Kitchen, which makes absolutely no freaking sense. How, how does that relate at all to the food being good? If somebody said Roost Country Kitchen to you, would you automatically say, oh, good food? No. It's just there's there's a step missing. So when there's a step missing, I'll often like think of the Ruth's Country Kitchen thing, and that's like it's 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 a terrible example, but it's one of one of my symbols. Uh, you know, like a, a rose might mean to you, it might mean romance. To somebody else, it might mean bad reality TV. That's so. But starting to just like recognize and pay attention to certain symbols and what they mean to you helps your, your guides communicate with you as far as pointing things out. You know, like you hear a certain sound bite and you know it, oh, that means this. So that was really a protracted way of trying to explain that. Murph. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to be goofy when I explain Murph at all. Murph is a, a little, um, like a little character, a little placeholder that I made for anger when I get irritated at something because I got tired of being irritated and crabby about things. But Murph is a, it basically like a little construct. He's a, an imaginary two-year-old with a poop gun. Yeah, real mature, right? And he shoots his poop gun at anything that irritates me. It's just like a little imaginary goofy thing. And so if something's irritating instead of being like, damn it, you know, like if I like drop something and it shatters or whatever, I'm just like Murph. And it's so it's like a shorthand. It's like a, a trajectory of like, okay, I'm a really irritable person and I'm always dropping things to boiling it down to this visualization and finally it's just like a word and it's a very unique let's say way of handling one's irritation yeah I don't feel goofy at all now let's just go right to the archetype shall we <laughs> student 
Also innocent, fool, idealist, and neophyte. So you're in a new position now. You're moving into this new territory. And you're striking out on a new beginning, the fool, the fool's journey. Which is, you know, this always sounds insulting, but it's not. It just means innocent. It means bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And that's a good thing. It's a, it's, you know, especially with the moon in Sagittarius and the thirst for knowledge. It makes sense. There are the random cards. Whoa. Pain. And metaphor. Hmm. A lot of what you've been through has been painful, but it's the kind of painful that lends itself really well to being worked out in uh, creative expression. And that it's um, also the kind of pain that's very relatable because while the details may differ in certain situations you've gone through from what other people go through, the commonalities are very strong. There's a, there's a, a, a main thread that runs through them that is very relatable. It's a, it's a matter of, you know, when you've processed it, I suppose, or actually part of processing it, it seems to me, would be transforming it into some sort of art some sort of creative expression it would help you um, examine it too as far as sort of drawing the the adjustments out of it you know the adjustments to avoid pain you sort of be able to to see where all those turns are in the corners and by being able to express that, you may save um, others from having to take as many steps through that particular forest as you had to, if that makes sense. Art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. That's a nice quote to, to follow up this whole thought of working things out because some sort of creative expression would wash away from your soul the dust of these experiences that were more than challenging but also you know ultimately which free you to have a, an expanded awareness Every good painter paints what he is, Jackson Pollock. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. There you go. It's like gradually, step by step, through this expression, It's like getting down the bones of this new incarnation of yourself, this new representation of yourself. And in that way, it sort of like helps you solidify it and, and give you some, some footing. Feel, be able to get uh, into a place where you've processed your experiences and you're really enjoying that balance and the expression of your experiences is helping you clear out any um, stagnant or blocked energy that might have built up through everything. The ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. By expressing these things once the expression is done, then holding on to those things would be unnecessary. Once you've gotten what you need to get from that, once it's been processed, holding on to it would be unnecessary. And so 
through art, it's a it's a fabulous way to 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 get it out. I never paint dreams or nightmares. I paint my own reality. Peter Collins. I would rather die of passion than of boredom. Vincent Van Gogh. What is possible in art becomes thinkable in life. Brian Eno. Beauty will save the world. Dostoevsky. Being able to channel that great power of your intention and also of what I feel is a very big heart. Being able to express the beauty of that great big heart. And dream dreams again. Dreams that help not only you, but help the world. You have the fire. You have the, the metal. You're tempered steel. You can do anything. I think you've been through probably the worst of what you're going to have to go through. It really feels like you've you've gone through, like you've walked over hot coals, you've crawled on broken glass, and I don't know why I get that feeling, but I just really do. But there's like this big celebration at the at the end of the the hot coal walk. Yeah. And who knows, maybe some hula dancing. Maybe you're going to go on a vacation somewhere tropical. Hey, hey, that would be a great way to celebrate your uh, your newfound freedom. Remember, that was a card back. I'm not just like pulling that out of thin air. This is 